his yellow sneakers tonight. He is feeling frisky. Look at that. Awesome. Awesome. That would have been, yeah, you should get some, like with your orange t-shirts with some bright yellow. Sh- yeah, you'd look great. Uh, so anyway, here we are in church again. It's, it's, uh, it's another week has gone by. We've all been through a lot of stuff, but here we are. We're, we're just a, a, a group of people, and we all come from different places. We all live in, a, in different towns. Some of us live in Tavares and Grand Island and Eustis and Mount Dora. We come from different places. You know, we grew up in different places. I'm from Massachusetts. Anyone else here from Massachusetts? Anybody? One? You're from Massachusetts? No, you're not. Don't you lie in church. Who's from New York? Got to be a bunch of those. Pennsylvania? Anyone born overseas in a different country? New York is kind of that. Yeah. We all come from different places, and we have different traditions. I grew up in a Jewish home. We kept kosher, all that kind of, I mean, it's kind of weird, you know, a little bit different. A lot of us have, speak different languages. We have different religions that we came from. You know, some of us grew up Catholic. Any Catholics in the house, right? Several of us. Methodists, any Methodists? Presbyterian? Pentecostal? There we go. Make some noise. What's wrong with you people? Oh! Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> so we're all, but we're all, uh, we're all a bit different. But we've all come here tonight. God's just kind of drawn us here tonight for a reason. And it's all because of Him. It does, you know, we have all of our differences, our different baggage that we bring to the equation. But, but we're all here for one reason, to meet with Jesus. And that's exciting to me. I was excited to be able to come back here and do this, to be able to do what He's allowed me the privilege of doing. I'm here. I'm Jewish. I'm hanging out with Catholics and Presbyterians and Pentecostals. And we're all here for one reason. It's Jesus Christ the Lord, you know. And so that's exciting. <clears throat> this past week, um, I went with Mike and Marsha Jenkins, and they took Meredith and I to Wachula. Do you know where Wachula is? That's another world. Wachula to the story of Jesus. Anyone ever heard of that? I posted some pictures. I don't know if you saw it. Place is amazing, right? There's this, this, it's an outside arena, and it's humongous, and it's open air. You know, there's just like a roof, and it's open air, but they curtain it off. And they build inside of it like Jerusalem. It's amazing. Like it's humongous. They have camels and horses and donkeys and stuff going through. They're riding full speed gallop. These Roman soldiers through this arena. And they're, it's the story of Jesus when he's born. And all the way through until he rises from the grave. It was an amazing, amazing thing. I don't know how many people were there that night, but I would venture to say there's probably a thousand people there. But they run day after day after day this time of year, and there's thousands of people that go to this thing. And so anyway, I'm there, and, and there's an intermission. It's like two and a half hours, almost three hours long. And there's an intermission halfway through, and I go outside, and it's just pretty hot in there, really. You know, it smells like duty, basically, because there's just horses and donkeys everywhere, and it's hot, so it's hot duty, which is really, really nice. And so you go outside during the intermission, we're outside and everyone's flocking out to the concession stands to get bottled water and, and hot dogs and stuff like that, although the smell didn't really warrant eating a hot dog, but you know, whatever. So we're outside and Meredith and I are standing away from the crowd, and this is an ah moment, you ready? And I was just holding her. Y'all are pathetic. So I was holding her, and, 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 and I was looking around. The crowd was away from us. We were kind of tucked away in a corner outside, and I was looking, and it dawned on me, like, there's like a thousand people here, and I looked at my wife, and I said, you know, she's been a Christian like her whole life, you know, grew up in church, and I'm kind of new at this thing, and I looked at her, and I was like, I am so happy to be a part of this thing, you know, this, this Christianity, it's like all these people are just celebrating Jesus, and at that moment, it dawned on me, like, there's no, no one's in there going, oh, that's the Methodist people, and those are the Presbyterians, and here's the Catholics, like, we were all in there, just ovation for Jesus because of what, what and who he is, you know, that's it, like, we were just part of this big thing, this worldwide thing that was going on, you know, it was just so exciting to be a part of that, and then I started thinking, my mind drifted, and I started thinking about this AD thing that we're doing on Sunday nights, you know, our church is doing it, and, I, and it dawned on me again, like, there's 
millions and millions of people across the earth. And it doesn't matter if you're Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic, all these people, they just, they just want to know about Jesus. These are, even people that don't know Jesus yet, they're watching this thing and no doubt there's people that are going to be coming to Jesus from this TV show. And I'm like thinking, man, millions, and I'm part of that. We're part of that thing. It's so amazing to be a part of this worldwide mission of Jesus, this movement that sweeps across the earth generation after generation and we're part of that that's going to be exciting to you it's going to be exciting to you so then after that I, I came to the church the other day and I was I was doing some work on here and I decided to watch a message from a pastor that I I, I just love listening to him. I've been listening to him for years his name is James McDonald we men here we did a study called downpour that he was teaching and I uh, this guy is the pastor of this monster church with like five campuses and 20,000 people, but he leaves this church for a week and him and his leaders, they go to Nepal. They go to Nepal and they're in this just, just little village and they're planting churches there. And, and here's James McDonald, the pastor of this mega church, right? And he's sitting in this house in a dirt floor in a circle on the ground with these just everyday folks that live there. And he's teaching these pastors, how, he's, he's, he's empowering them and teaching them so they could plant churches and bless people and spread the kingdom through Nepal. And, and so what happened, the next scene, it transitions, and he's actually down, there's this grimy, nasty river that runs through town. And, it, and, the, and some of the leaders of the local church that got planted, they put some rocks in the river to block the water so that there was a little bit of a pool. And I'm telling you, the pool was maybe, you know, the size of this little carpet, like right here. And, it was, and it, the color was the color of this rug. It was just mud and disgusting. And James McDonald is on his hands and knees, and he's baptizing 22 people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this, and I'm looking at this, I'm going, we are part of that. We're part of that. We're, we're part of that. Come here a second. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Take your shoes off. This is Brandon. See, say hello to Brandon. Yeah. You guys know Michael, right? You say hello to Michael. <clears throat> they got some good news for you. Come here, Michael. Come here. See, we're, we're watching this in Nepal that they're getting, they're baptizing people, right? And I also get a phone call from Michael that this young man who came to church here for the first time, he's, he, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, he's going to tell you the story, but he's been, you know, working with this guy and telling him about Jesus for years. He came to church here last week for the first time and now he wants to get baptized. It's awesome, right? Michael, you do your thing, man. You do, do your thing. I don't want to, go ahead. Say hi. Oh, hey. All right. Can y'all hear me good? do something right now? No, just wanted to see Oh. What up, Kyle? Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, so, so turn around. Say hello to everybody. Brandon. Hold on. Hey. Say hey, hello to Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my buddy, Brandon. We've been friends for about 10 years now. You know, closest brothers. Just plain and simple, brothers. And Brandon, if you would, if you'd walk over there and read that, since you didn't get to last week. Uh, so for 10 years now, me and Brandon, we have been doing the devil's bid, plain and simple. We've been screwing up left and right, drinking, smoking, gambling, and all the other stuff y'all don't want to hear about. <laughs> well, I've been working for about three years to get Brandon in church. He finally shows up. That one time is all it took for Jesus to open up his heart. And now here he is, getting ready to get baptized. It's just, it, it's, it's such an honor, because I've been trying so hard and begging God all the time to get him here. Now he's here. And Brandon, if you're ready, ready. hop in the tank. That's it. Awesome. <laughs> oh. 
Awesome. 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 Careful, don't fall. It's very slippery. Mike, will you do me a favor? When, you, when he gets out, can you grab that towel and just do this before somebody falls on their face? Thank you, brother. Thank you. Awesome. All right, so... Um, if you don't mind, grab a Bible. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's plenty of them all over the place. There's yellow ones, there's orange ones. There's a couple of verses that'll be up on the screen, and we will uh, put them up on the screen if we're going to read them together. Um, we started this series. It's called Church 316. You guys know a lot of uh, verses. Or three, there's a lot of 316s in the Bible. There's a very popular one, of course, John 316. I mentioned this last week that um, my wife, her birthday is on 316, and so... We started, for some reason, we just started reading 316s that day, and what I, what I found as I read through the 316s, that, that, that John 316 was not the only powerhouse in the Bible. I started reading these things, and I'm like, wow, God has something, he's got some fancy for 316s. Now, I understand that, that God didn't put the references in. That's man-made stuff. He inspired men to write the Bible, but the, the verses, the references, those are, that's what we've done so we could find stuff. But I think God had something to do with that, you know what I mean? Because he loves 316s. There's some awesome 316s in the Bible. Now, as a church family, we're, you know, we're always trying to figure out what we're supposed to do, you know? And so I was reading, as, as I was reading through these 316s, I found out that, that everything that the church should be is everything in the 316s. Everything in here is a, is a game plan, if you will, a, a, a little journey through the 316s, and it's going to tell you exactly how we're supposed to function, what the church is, what it looks like, what we're supposed to do, everything. It's all found in the 316s. And so for, for five weeks, I want to challenge you to be here because I believe that, that 2015 is a huge year for our church, and I think this study through the 316s will be the framework that we need to live in. And so I want to challenge you to be here for five weeks straight. Now, I want to, I want to start uh, with, with the most popular one. I want to, I want to talk about the, the, the most popular 316, and as you know, it's John 316. Now, I don't, want to, I don't want to start with that thing because it's the most popular, though. I want to start with that thing because before we uh, decide to endeavor to put our heart and soul into the church of Jesus Christ, we need to understand that, it's, that Jesus said 2,000 years ago that he's going he's gonna to do something. He's going to build his church and the gates of hell wouldn't prevail against it. So if he said he's going to build his church before we as people venture into this thing, we should know exactly who God is and we should know that, you know, should I put all my eggs into his basket? Who is this one that, that says we should serve him? Who is this one that says we should go on mission across the earth and tell people about him and risk our lives sometime and give of all of our resources to this? Who is this one that asks this of us? And so we want to study the most popular one and it's not because it's the most popular. The reason why we search, uh, the reason why we want to study John 3.6 16 first is because Jesus Christ, the, the head of the church, said that, he said to the religious folks, he said, you know, you search the scriptures day and night looking for eternal life. See, so, and he, so he says, you search the scriptures, all these, you, you look at all the 316s, you look at all the 220s. You look at all the 415s, you look at all the 27.5s, you look at all of these searching for everlasting life, but all the while, all of them, every 316 points to me. All of them point to Jesus. And so I want to study something first. I want to look at this first. I want to talk about John 3.16 because one, it's Jesus quote and it's all about him. So that's what we want to look at first because that's going to establish who this king is that says we should go charge the gates of hell on his behalf. We need to learn who he is. So let's, let's do this. Let's read John 3.16 together. Can you bring it up on the screen for me, please, Lane? Can you? There we go. You guys ready to read? Can you see it? All right, let's go. For God so loved the world... Amen. That's good stuff, right? That's a good quote. 
That's a good quote. That's a good verse. Now, I want to just point out a couple of things to you about John 3.16, other than it's the most popular verse ever. But here's what I want to do first. I want to say a quick prayer with you because if you're like me, if you've read a verse over and over and over again, sometimes it's like having pizza for dinner every single night. It may be your favorite dish, but after a while, you just kind of blaze right through it like it's no big thing. So I want to pray with you for a moment. So if I could ask you to just bow your heads and close your eyes for just one moment and pray with me. Father, I, th I thank you for this verse. I thank you for the truth that it holds. I thank you, Lord, that your spirit can come right now. And that's what we're asking for. Your spirit would come right now and shed new light on this verse for us. Open up our mind and heart to receive new enlightened power from this verse, Lord. Help us not to breeze by it. Help us not to say, oh, I've read that a million times. But teach us something from it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Here's just a couple of things. Don't blow by this. We want to talk about God. Here's, here's a couple of things. Let's find out who God is. First of all, he's a loving God. We know this because it says, for God so loved the world. Now, before you just blow by that, let me just say this. You can go to church, and, and, and I think that this is pretty good here. I, I think that, that we're pretty good at loving each other. I know that when I walk in here, I know that people tell me that they love me. And I tell you that I love you. And that's cool. Jared, I love you. Yeah, it's good. Kat, I love you. Yeah. See, there's a difference between that and like Jameson or Meredith. Because like I, I, I'll go up to my wife. I won't just say, hey man, I love you and give her the man, the bro hug, you see? So what I'll do to my wife is in the quiet moments when no one's there, I'll look her in the eyes and I'll just say, I love you, I'm gonna use you as an example, I love you so much, right? I mean, you do that to your spouse, you could do that to your kids, your kid could even do that to you, your child can come up to you and say, Daddy, I love you so much. But if I went up to you in church and I said, Mandy, I just love you so much. Jimmy, I love you so much. That could be a little bit weird. That could be a little bit weird, right? Honestly, I mean, we're supposed to love one another. Jesus said, they'll know you by the way you love one another. But if I went up to you and said, Jared, I just love you so much, that would be freaky. But here's the thing about God. That's reason, let me just say this. That's reserved for special people, isn't it? You don't say that to everybody, but God did. God said, I, for God so loved the world, he, so he could go to every single person on earth and say, Jared, I love you so much. Jay, I love you so, so much. That's what God says about every person on earth. It's not reserved for certain special people the way we are. I reserve it for my wife. I reserve it for my children. But I don't do it for you. God says it about every single person in this room right now and every single person who's not in this room. God loves you so much. We know God's loving. We also know that he's compassionate because he loves you so much that he did something about it. See, it's one thing we Christians, we say, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. But not all of us will do something to alleviate a hurt. You see, Jesus is compassionate because he, he's, he, he does stuff. He responds to the love. There's, there's a love inside of him that's so strong that he does stuff. It says that God loved every single person so much that he gave, that he sent his son. He did something. See, compassion isn't just loving. Compassion is feeling what the person feels and deciding then to actually come alongside and do something to alleviate that pain. And that's what God does by sending. His love is so strong that he does something about it. It required action, and that's what he did. So we know that he's loving. We know that he's compassionate. We also know that he is generous. The reason why we know that he is generous is because he loved us so much that he sends his only begotten son. Do you know what begotten means? In the Greek, it's monogenous. It's unique. It's the only one of its kind. See, if I had a billion dollars to my name and I said, here, let me give you five bucks, 
That's no big deal, is it? But what if I only had five bucks? And I said, here's my five bucks. That's a big deal, isn't it? That's a big deal because there's only one Jesus. And he was willing to give his best because he loves you so much. So we know that he is loving. We know that he is generous. We know that he is compassionate. Let's go on now. That is sort of who God is. We want to do, oh, that's what I want to establish tonight is who God is. So you can know who you're going in on. What God did is wrapped up in John 3.16. He acted and he gave his best. It's also what man did or what man can do. We can believe and we can live. So that's good. But before we, as the church, establish what we're going to do, and before we, 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 we pour all of our resources the way Jesus wants us to into the mission of the church advancement in this world, before we decide to pursue him and pursue this mission, we need to know really who God is. Because if we're going to go all in on something, you need to know that it's, a, it's, the, it's the right thing to go in on, right? Because you don't want to waste your time. Who wants to waste their time? I don't want to waste my time. I want to know that this is, the real, this is the right thing to do. So let's talk about who God is. Here's the first thing. Here's a, here's a 316. Go to Exodus 316. Open up that Bible. Exodus 316. If you don't have a Bible, like I said, that's a nice purse you got there, Jared. Sparkly. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one of ours here. And you can put it, can you put it up on the screen for me, Lane? That's okay. That's right there. Go ahead. Because I want to start there in 3.15 too. Come on. Just put it up. Put it up. Did I write 3.15? All right, anyway, listen to this. You ready there? You all ready? Now, Moses has been sent to go to the Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. You all know that story, right? So this is what it says in 3.16. We want to learn about who God is. It says this, now go, this is God speaking, now go and call together all the elders of Israel. Tell them the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me. He told me I have been watching closely and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. So you see it there? The first thing about God is that he sees See, he sees his people. He's watching closely his people. The Bible says that he sees them. Now, I've mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning it again. I have children, and sometimes, especially my little girls, I'll just say not Jackson yet because he's too little, and definitely not Blair, but Adriana and Jameson have a thing about doing performances at the house. Anyone have a daughter, a little girl? Daddy, watch me. Right? Do you get that? Daddy, watch. Oh, yeah. Watch me. Watch, Daddy. So, so when, 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 when Serenity comes over the house, or BB comes over the house, or a friend, An uh, uh, Angie comes over the house, or Elizabeth, they go into the bedroom and they, they decide on these little dance performances, and then they come out, Daddy, watch. Daddy, watch. And, and, and Jameson's starting to do it too. Daddy, watch. Like, she just wants me to go to the playroom in the garage there and just sit and watch her. Like, I don't even need to get down and play. She just wants me to watch her. And it's come to my attention that, 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 that watching her somehow in her mind equates to loving her. She wants me to watch her. I, I don't understand. Like, I don't want someone to watch me do what I do. I don't want you to sit there and stare over my shoulder as I'm studying. That would make me creeped out. Like, get out of my face. But she really wants me to watch her. If you're a dad, like, I, don't, I can't speak for mommies because I'm not one, but daddies, you get it, right? It happens all the time. Watch me. There's something about them they need to know that you're watching them. Somehow our little souls just have this, this thing inside that says, watch me. And if your eyes are upon me, that must mean that you love me. And so it's actively seeing, like it's no blank stare from God. God's not just like, and don't, you, don't you hate when, some, when you're talking to someone? And, and I get it up here all the time when someone's not paying attention. 
And so you get this blank stare all the time, and it'll just drive you absolutely crazy. Do you, don't you just hate when people do that, right? I hate when people do that. Does anyone else hate when, pe- when you're trying to tell them something that's, that you feel is really meaningful, and they're just totally blank, and they're not paying attention? Who hates that? Raise your hand. Everyone, right? That's not what God's doing. He's not just sitting there passively, just, want, just like staring off into space, and it happens to catch his peripheral vision. No, no, no. God is actively seeking. Second Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord go back and forth across the earth, looking to strengthen those whose hearts are committed to him. That's a great place for an amen. And look, look. I want, I'd like to know, is he, when he's actively looking across the earth, looking to strengthen those whose hearts are completely committed to him, is he stopping at your house? Oh, hallelujah. Yeah, that's what you should venture to do every day. This, I, God, I want your eyes to stop on my house because I need your help. I'm totally committed to you. I absolutely need you. You're darn right you're my crutch. I need you. I can't do this alone. And so he'll look for you. He's actively seeking you. It says he's watching us carefully. Seeing all is good and it's bad. It's good if you need help. It's bad if you want to do evil. We know God is a God that watches us all the way back. Back, back, back in creation. After he created everything, what does he say? He says that that God looked and saw what? All that he had made. All that he had made, he said, this is good, right? It wasn't partial. He didn't look at a portion of it. No, he looked at all that he had made. Every single thing on earth was created by God. He looked at every single thing and said, it is good. It is good. All right? So we know one first thing is that God sees. He watches you carefully. He watches you carefully. And that, my friends, is a reason to believe that he loves you. It's evidence of his love that he watches you. See, I wouldn't stop what I was doing, honestly, to some kid off the street that I didn't know and said, hey, can you come watch my dance routine? I probably wouldn't stop, okay? But I love my daughters, and so when they say, watch, Daddy, what do I do? I stop and I watch. It's evidence of my love for them, and it's evidence of God's love for you. He's watching you closely. Here's the second thing. It's found in 1 John chapter 5. Go there. 1 John chapter 5. We're finding out about who God is. Who God is. It's my hope that tonight I can tell you about God so you know about him, but what I really want to see happen is you start to take this stuff in and you start to exercise it so that you can know God. Not just know about him, but know him. Here's, here's, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, he says, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So he's writing to Christians, people who believe in Jesus. Why? So that you may know you have eternal life. So what he's saying here is the stuff just before this and the stuff just after this, if you want to know if you're, if you're a Christian, if you want to know that you're going to be in heaven with him someday, you read 1 John and you're going to know. Okay, you read 1 John, and he's going to tell you what you need to know to ensure that you're a Christ follower. But this is one of the things he says. He says, and we are confident, next verse, and we are confident that he hears us. You see it there? So he sees us, and what else? He hears us. He, we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. Now I'm going to read on. And since we know he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. Now, I want to dispel something here. This is a total side note. For those people that go around teaching that if you pray for stuff, you know, ask for anything in my name, it'll be given to you. And if it isn't, it's because you didn't have enough faith and you didn't believe enough. No, 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 no. Read what it says. When does he hear you? Is it because you wanted something, right? And, and, and you didn't get it, so you didn't have enough faith. You didn't believe it. No, no, I think it gives us some, some information here we should take in. He says he hears us when? When we ask for anything that pleases him. So since we know he hears us when we make our requests that please him, 
Not necessarily you, right? When, he, when you ask for stuff that pleases him, then we know he'll give you it. Okay? So we have to make sure that we're in his will when we're praying if we want things to happen. Okay, so we know that he, he sees us and we know that he hears us. So who is God? Is he some absentee father who's never around? Well, I don't think so. The scriptures tell us in Psalm 46.1 that he is ever-present. He's ever-present. He's, he's always there watching. He's, he's hearing his people. And, and so some might say, well, well, I prayed for this, and I prayed for that, and, and nothing happened. Well, let me just tell you something. He's not just some God that, that helps you out just when you're having a bad day. He's not Aladdin. He's not a genie. He's not Robin Williams, the big blue genie. And when you need something, you just rub the lamp, and, and out comes the genie, and he does whatever you need. See, that's not... What, what God is. Now, uh, we go back to Exodus, which we looked at a moment ago, and we go back to 1 John 5.14. These both tell us something that, that tells of God's motivation and his timing. Now, if, do me a favor. Keep your finger in 1 John, where we are, and go back to Exodus real quick and look and see why is God sending Moses and the leaders and everything to go talk to, to Pharaoh? Is it, is it to help them out? What, what, why? What's the motivation behind God acting on our behalf? What does it say in, in verse, um, uh, verse 18? So he, he's told them that he's watching closely. I see how the Egyptians are treating you. And at the very end of 18, it says this. So please let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness. In other words, let us go. Why? to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. See, there's something about him there. It's not about us. Like at the center of everything, it's not us, the little people. It's God, right? God's about God. And he wants his people to be released. Why? To, to help them out? Yes, but that's a byproduct of them worshiping him because that's what pleases him. He wants them to go into the desert to, set, to, to make sacrifices for him. And then also, like I said a moment ago, 1 John 5, 14, where comfort he hears us when we ask for anything that pleases him. Let us go and so we can make sacrifices to the Lord. He hears us when we ask for anything that pleases him. It's, that's his motivation for acting. It's because of him, not because of us. Here's some more. 1 Samuel 12, 22. He won't abandon his people. Why? For his namesake. It's for his namesake. So go his people, so go God. That's what people see. If, people, if, if God's people are blessed and protected and favored, that's good for his name's sake. It's good for his praise. It's good for his renown. Psalm 106, 8, that he defends his people. Why? To defend the honor of his name and to display his mighty power. Here's some more. We're not going to read them, but you can jot them down if you want to read them. There are more verses where God acts on our behalf, but it's for his namesake. Isaiah 43, 6 and 7. Isaiah 48, 10 and 11. And Ezekiel 20, verse 14. All three of these are God acting on our behalf, but the motivation behind it is what? For his name's sake. you got to know who God is. That's what motivates him. It's for his name's sake. Now let's talk timing for a second. So when we say that God hears us when we ask for things that please him, what he's saying is, I will act. I will act on your behalf, but I'm going to do it when it's best for who? For you or for him? For him. I'm going to do it when it's best for me. See, fixing somebody's bad day, that's kind of so-so. Like if you're having a bad day and you call out to the Lord and he helps you, that's good, right? Would you agree? That's good. And he does that, right? Okay, but delivering two million people from 400 years of slavery with an empire-wide nature-controlling set of, of signs and wonders that display his power, now that's awesome. That's awesome, you know what I'm saying? It's so awesome that we're talking about it right now, 3,400 years later. That's why he does stuff. 
Yeah, he blessed those people, but he did it for his praise and his renown. That's why he does stuff. And we're still talking about it. Just think about that. 3,400 years ago that happened, and I'm sitting here screaming about it, hoorah, right now. That's amazing, right? Does anyone else think that's amazing? That's incredible. 3,400 years. 30, I can't even fathom that number. Let me ask you guys a question. Do you know what happened on um, April 25th, 1921? I mean, that was only 94 years ago. That wasn't that long ago. Does anyone remember what happened on April 25th, 1921? And nobody does, right? Yeah, I don't either. You know why? Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But what, hap- what I'm telling you happened 3,400 years ago, and we still talk about it. They still make movies about it right now. That's, what, that's what's awesome about God. When he displays his power, it's for his glory, for his namesake, and that's why he does it. You need to know that about God. He sees, he hears, he knows, and when and how he acts is for his glory. That's his motivation, and that's his timing. Let me talk to you a little bit about Jesus, right? We claim Jesus is God. Well, he's, then he'd be doing the same thing, right? When Lazarus was sick, and they came to him, and they said, Rabbi, you need to come and, and help this guy. He's going to die. What happened? What, 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 listen, when someone comes to you, we're Christians, and someone comes to you and says, hey, I need help, what are you supposed to do? Go help him. Chop, chop, right? But we're supposed to be like Jesus. And he didn't chop, chop. Why? Why didn't Jesus chop, chop? We're supposed to chop, chop. We're Christians. Get at it. Go help him, right? You better go help me if I need you. Why didn't Jesus do that? You know why? Because God's motivation is for his own namesake. Because it's not as awesome to fix a sick guy as it is to raise a dead guy. And that's why he did what he did. Because that's his motivation. is to bring glory and praise to him. And raising a dead guy. Can you you raise a dead guy? I can't raise a dead guy. Can you raise a dead guy? I've never, I can't. I'll venture to say none of you can raise a dead guy. But Jesus did. And he did it. Why? To bring glory to God. To bring glory to God. Because it's more awesome to raise a dead guy. Okay? It's more awesome to raise a dead guy. But God is good. Not only does he raise dead guys, but I know that he he does fix some sick people, you know. Uh, I don't know where uh, Art is tonight, but you guys all know Art. One of the guys was staying at Pete and Daisy's uh, house, house. You know what I'm saying? I don't know where he's at, but his brother, he was going to share this with you, his brother was on life support, and his liver was shot. Done, gone. Doctor said there's nothing we can do to help him. He's dead. He's going to die in a matter of days. He was on life support, and he was done. A couple, 24 hours to die. 24 hours. He works with Jared, so got the inside scoop. The other day, uh, people from his church came to him, and they all got around him, and they laid hands to him, and they prayed for him, and they're taking him off life support. He's totally healthy. And the doctors say it's a miracle. We don't know what happened. I don't know. That's insane, right? And they're 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 talking about releasing him like Thursday. (laughs) He was going to die in 24 hours. They're going to release him. His liver is coming back. His kidneys are starting to function again. You know, I, I, like, I, don't, I don't get it. You know what I'm saying? But, but, it was, but the church came to him. They did what it says. You know, let, come around and pray for him and bring healing. And it, it's to bring glory to God. That's why he does what he's supposed to do. That's what he does. Seeing and hearing. You know what? It's not just like passive seeing, glancing. It's, it's kind of like data entry. Like you see the data, but it's getting inside of God. So when I say that God sees and he hears and he knows, it's data entry. It's the stuff. He sees it, but it's getting into his heart. He, he feels your pain. He sees the situation. He, he, he understands and feels your fears and your hunger. Like he sees all that. I know what's going on. That's the type of seeing and hearing that we're talking about. Like, I see stuff all the time. Like, I could see someone walking by me when I'm going down the street, but I don't understand what's burdening their heart, and God does. You see, he sees that. So let me give you a little transitional verse. We know that he sees, we know that he hears, we know that he acts. Do me a favor, and let's go from Exodus all the way to Revelation, all the way to the back of the book. Revelation 3.16 But I want to read 315 first. 
Let it lead right into 316. You guys there? Yeah? All right. It's kind of a, a, a I don't know, when, when Jesus says this, it's kind of like a, a, a full wrap-up of what I've just said. He says, I know all the things you do. <laughs> you know, that's like, I see it, I hear it, I know it. I know all the things you do. Let's read on. That you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, Jesus says. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You ever meet someone and you ask them if they're a Christian and they say, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in God. But they're like very sporadic Bible reading. You know, they don't spend too much time at Jesus' feet. They don't feel the need for it. They got this thing figured out. You know, you don't see a whole lot of giving. You don't see a lot of serving. You don't see a lot of praying. Praying is kind of off the table most of the time. Maybe some obligatory prayers before dinner or with your kids, you know, now I lay my head to rest or whatever. There's not a whole lot of passion for the things of God. They're not really pouring themselves into that relentless pursuit of Christ. They're not relentlessly pursuing souls in the name of the king through their local expression here at their church. And I'm not just saying here, I'm saying worldwide. I mean, you just know people that say they're Christ followers, but they're really not following Christ. And so that's what God is saying here in red letters. Jesus is saying this. He says, you're kind of lukewarm. Like you, you, you kind of are. You say you're a Christian, but you're kind of not. And he's saying, I'd rather you just say, like, like, I'm just not. I'm just not even a Christian. Don't, don't, don't say, you're, you know, don't you hate when people just say, and you know they don't mean it. Come on now, right? Like, don't be two-faced. Don't be hypocritical. Like, you, you, don't you just, ooh, that just drives you crazy, right? And so what Jesus is saying here, listen, um, y- y- you, say, you say you are, but I see all this. I know all the things that you do. I know all the things that you do. And, and, and so, I, I, I don't know, man. See, see I think what, what this is talking about here, it talks about seeing and hearing and knowing, but it adds an element that, that's crucial to God's mission and for your joy. He says, I know all that you do. I, I see, I hear, I know. I know what you do, and I know why you do it, you see? I, I, I know what other people are doing to you, too, much like the Egyptians. I know what they were doing to you, and I know why. I know why you gather, and I know why you give, and I know why you serve, and I know why you pray, and I know when you pray. Man may see the outside, but Jesus says, I see the inside. I know all that you do. And so his plea to those that are lukewarm is found in verse 19. It says, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. And someone, maybe many of us need to hear that tonight. Maybe that word is for you. To, t- to be diligent and turn from your indifference. You know what indifference is? Indifference is, yeah, I believe, but very little Bible. Yeah, I believe, but sporadic giving and poor priorities, shallow prayer life. It- it's kind of like a no big deal. Oh, well. It's a nonchalant approach to to the creator of the universe. It's what the Bible says, treating the gospel as common. Like we can look back like the people of Israel have done. And they can look back on all that God has done. He's the one who spoke and the heavens were created. The one who, who said something and the Red Sea opened up before their very eyes. The one who created all this food with a little happy meal. The one who raised people from the dead. The one who saw blind people and made them see. Who took sick people and made them well. Who took paralyzed people and made them walk. Here, here's, here's, and we see, we know this, and God's done so much in our lives personally, amen? Right? He's done a whole lot. And what do we do? We treat it like it's common. It's no big deal. There's no passion for the Lord. See, the Bible says in Hebrews that that he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. And that's what he's looking for from us, for us to be earnestly seeking him. But too many of us are indifferent about him. What does indifference look like in the Bible? 1 Kings chapter 18. You can go there, please. 
Go to 1 Kings chapter 18. Let me give you a little backstory on that. King Ahab is the king of Israel, and the Bible says that he is the worst king they ever had. As far as, not, maybe not as so far as, you know, how you treated the people maybe, but as far as disregarding what God said to do, he was the worst one yet. Now the people of Israel, the, these are God's people. It's not that they didn't believe in God, but what happened here, if you read the story in, in 1 Kings 17 and 18, you're going to find out that they believed in God, but their focus and their loyalty began to spread out. They had endless miracles. Just think about that. I mean, we, we, have the, we have the Bible, right? We have the Bible. We can see all these incredible stories of what God did, right? They lived them. They lived them. They were there when the Red Sea split open. They were there when, the, when, the Mount, when Mount Sinai was, was rumbling. They were there when, 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 when Jesus was baptized and the voice from heaven said, that's my son who I'm, I'm, who I'm well pleased. Listen to him. They were there when all this was happening. This is the nation of Israel. They had endless miracles to reflect on, but still their loyalty went plural. And they began to not only worship God in a sense, but let me tell you something. Worshiping God is worshiping God exclusively. Anything shy of that is not worshiping God. But they went plural and they started worshiping Baal. And they started worshiping Asherah. Now how many people in this room are worshiping Asherah? Yeah, no one. But, but, but let me ask you a question. We're talking about worship, right? Where do you find your identity? Where are you supposed to find your identity? In God. You're, you're, a, a crea you're a creation that's made in the image of God. The Imago Dei. Made in his image with value and worth. To be like him. To be like his son. That, that, and, you, and, you're, and if you've accepted Christ, you're a son or a daughter of, of the king. That's your identity, right? But how many of us or seek our identity in that? Or maybe we seek our identity in our job. How much money I make. How much people approve of who I am. Maybe, maybe I don't find my security, my provision in God Almighty who says, if you seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, all that you need will be taken care of. You take care of my business, I'll take care of yours. But we find our identity and our provision and our protection in our government, in our country. I don't know. If anyone in here is worshiping Asherah, but I know that some of us are guilty of being culturally shaped and driven rather than gospel shaped and gospel driven. And that's where God's calling us. God shows himself mightily, mightily, time and time again to us, myself included, and still I'm prone to wander. I am. And so what, is the, what does God say here? Those that are indifferent. If you go to 1 Kings chapter 18... Let's read this together. What does he say? Verse 20, read it. You ready? So this is what happens. Elijah the prophet, the man of God, gathers up all the leaders from Israel and all the religious folks of the other, the other religions, the prophets of Baal and Asher and all that, and he's calling them to Mount Carmel for a challenge. He's going to show them all who the only true God is. And so in verse 20, this is what he says. So Ahab, the king, summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them, just like I'm doing right now, and he says this, and maybe this is a word for you. How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, if anything else is God, don't be lukewarm and follow both. Because eventually you're going to split your pants if you're in two boats. Okay? If the Lord is God, follow him. He sees everything. He hears everything. And he acts on your behalf for his namesake. The pressure's off. He's going to act for you to keep his own reputation. This is who God is, and if this is God, do not be indifferent, be diligent, and turn from this indifference and follow him. And this is what the people do. 
Talk about indifference. But the people were completely silent. Do you, do you, just, do you sense what they're going through? Very, kind of what we would be going through, I'm sure, many of us. I don't know what to say. You're like, I don't know what to do. Like, I, I, I do. I look back and I've seen what he's done. I've read the book. I know what he's done and it's crazy. And I know what he's done in my life. But yet, I won't pick up my Bible. I know what he's done in my life, but yet I won't give. I know what he's done, but I won't serve. Because I just, they're going to ask too much of me and I'm too busy. Silence. I don't know what to do. Just simple, three steps. Decide who you're going to follow. I mean, who, who, who you follow? Just make the decision, right? Just, step one is decide who you're going to follow. If the Lord is God, and I believe if, there's, there's only three people in this room that I do not know and know well. And I think all of you do believe that the Lord is God. Right? Kinda, I think so. And so what he's saying here is, is if I'm really God, the creator of heaven and earth, I spoke and planets came out of my mouth. Follow me. <laughs> That's step one. And then step two, you could call it continue to follow, but, but let's do this. Just make a choice to pray. Make a choice to serve. Make a choice to give. Make a choice to do what we've always said since day one when this church started. Open it, read it, and what? Do it. If the Lord is God and he's doing stuff for his namesake to make sure his reputation is intact, don't you think everything he wants you to do is gonna be a blessing? even if you don't think it's going to be? So, so the first one is decide what you're gonna, who you're going to follow. The second one is decide, choose to pray and to study and to serve in your local context right here. And here's the third one. This is, this is on everyone's menu. You've got to have this. And it's repent when you fail at number two. We, we need to have a posture of repentance. All, a Christian should be, they, they, we should be on our knees more than we're on our feet. Amen? We, we should. Because we're all going to fail. The Bible says in James that we all fail in many ways. We're going to. So when we make a choice to pray and to study and to serve and to give and to do all these things that God wants for us, we're going to fail. Right? So what's number three? Repent when you fail. Repent when you wander. We know our God loves his church because he has compassion and he sends his best to his bride. We also know that he loves his church because he actively sees, he, he hears, and he knows all that's going on in our lives. And he acts on our behalf, but here's, and I, wanted, I don't want to, I don't want to, to not say this, I have to say this again, this is, this is the most important thing. He acts on our behalf for his namesake. Did, did you feel, remember when Jessica said breathe? You should all be exhaling right then and there. The pressure's off. Isn't it good to know that he's not going to act on your behalf because you deserve it? Isn't it good to know that you didn't have to earn his blessing? That when he does stuff on our behalf, it's for his namesake. He's going to do it for his own glory. He's going to bless you so he can be praised. See, he's, he, he loves himself, and I don't blame him. He should. He's awesome. And he loves himself so much, he's going to do stuff for you so that he can be praised. It takes the pressure off of us. He asks how and when he'll receive the most fame and the most praise. Now, since he sees and hears and knows and acts 
And we know this scripturally, because we've read it, and we know it experientially in our own lives, then there's only one reasonable response, and it cannot be indifference. It cannot be indifference. We can pour out everything that we are into the church, into the mission of the church, if we know the Lord is God. And so what I've done for you tonight, like I said earlier, is I've given you some information about who God is so that you can know about him. But the only way you're going to pour yourself into the life and the forward motion of the church, and it advances, is if you go from knowing about him to knowing him. If you will start to, 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 to ex exercise these things, like praying and realizing that he actually is hearing you. Like the creator of the universe hears your cry for help. Like if you can not just sit and, and throw up your prayers, but to sit and, and, and as you're praying, be thinking about this, that he is listening to me, right? There's no other group of people on the earth that have that privilege, that can actually say that their God is listening to them, that he hears their cry for help, that he's watching every single thing in your life, and he has your best interest at heart. Who can say this but the Christ follower? We're privileged people. And if you'll start to exercise those, those gifts that we have as Christ followers, you'll begin to experience him. You'll realize it when he hears you. you when you're praying and you're, and you're just living out your day, you're going to notice that he's watching you. And that's encouraging because like our kids, when we're watching them, they know that they are loved. And so if you begin to realize that, if you start taking the words of the scripture that says that he watches you carefully and you start realizing that and that's the way you live your life knowing that Almighty God is watching you and hearing you and he's going to act on your behalf for his own namesake, you're going to know that you're loved. Amen? Amen. And I want you to know that you're loved. I don't want you to know about God. I want you to know God.